And it appears that we are live. Uh, great. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Cafetzis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's lab, and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again begin by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this ever-expanding initiative towards a greener uh, and much more accessible seminar world. Of course, having said that, allow me to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from Zanilia Research Campus, Dr. Keith Longdon. Following his studies in physics at the University of Manchester, Keith went on and obtained in 2005 his PhD in computational neuroscience from the University of Edinburgh. After a couple of uh, years in the neuroinformatics network, studying the neural basis of geotaxis in Drosophila, he moved to the bioengineering department of Imperial as a research associate in the Krab lab and focused on the state-dependent visual processing in the blowfly. In 2014, Keith moved to Janilia, where he has been located ever since, and nowadays as a research scientist in Michael Reiser's lab. With uh, a number of fascinating projects and by employing uh, a plethora of techniques ranging from behavioral to anatomical and to functional and computational, they seek to understand how different visual cues with uh, color, of course, at the spotlight are detected by the visual system and processed throughout the brain. Uh, therefore, today, uh, we have the pleasure of hearing about their latest and I'm sure exciting findings in his talk entitled Synergy of Color and Motion Vision for Detecting Approaching Objects in Drosophila. So without any further ado from my side, please all welcome Dr. Longden. Kit, the stage is officially all yours. Cool. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much, George. It's very kind of you. Um, it's an honor to present here today, uh, both to present for Worldwide Neuro. So I totally echo your, your, what you were saying about that. It's been such a good idea. So thank you to all those involved. Uh, but also to the department at Sussex, a long time hero, um, home of uh, personal heroes. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, So, oh, and um, George does really interesting work on um, the retinas of sharks. So um, I really highly recommend you uh, talk to him about his work if you get the chance. Um, okay, I work on um, color uh, motion vision in flies. And today I'm gonna tell you about a study I wrote, recently posted on BioArchive. Um, and also um, a little bit about a paper we, um, uh, recently um, came out in eLife that was um, a collaboration with Matthias Vernitz lab in Berlin. So, um, oops, sorry. So when I say color vision, I'm really interested in UV vision. Um, so we humans don't have a very good intuition about just how useful UV can be. And the last few years have been a really exciting time for discovering how UV is used by different animals in different ways for very specific behaviors. So in the mouse, the retina is organized to see UV in the sky, not the ground. And this graphic is, uh, is from a great, uh, great recent paper from Thomas Euler's lab and collaborators. And following their ideas and data, it looks like mice could use their color vision, for example, to spot predators in the sky. So here we go. Um, so that's a task that very much involves motion. Now, on the other hand, in larval zebrafish, in lovely work by Takeshi Yoshimatsu in Sussex's own Tom Barden's lab, it looks like they use luminance, the brightness of light, to watch the sky, color vision to see the world beneath and around them, and UV to spot predators like, um, sorry, um, prey like paramecia. So spotting prey is also very much a task involving motion. So traditionally, Motion and color vision are thought of as fairly separate computations, and that color can help with motion detection when they're isoluminant edges. So, say, if I was a fly seeing this image of a citrus fruit, um, there'd be some edges that were equally bright for my luminance channel. So, we take these two edges here for my luminance channel. Um, they could be equally bright, and then I wouldn't be able to see their motion. 
However, if I use color information, then I could. So I hope to persuade you today um, of a mechanism by which color and wavelength processing can do much more than this um, for detecting object motion. It's not just about, the mechanism isn't just about detecting features of natural scenes, but having mechanisms match to your behavior that allow your movements to augment your sensory experiences, okay? So in flies, we know that UV illumination is important for many behaviors, including things like, here I've just picked three. So it's choosing where to lay your eggs, um, circadian entrainment and navigation. So these are all behaviors where, in addition to having genetic access to the neurons, we also have access to connectomes and wiring diagrams of the underlying circuitry. So we can really look into how wavelength information flows through the brain and supports very different kinds of important behavior. But these behaviors um, are all about the illumination. And if there's a weak point in looking at color in the fly, it's that we know very little about how flies use UV to see objects that they're interested in. So that's partly because um, studies have used human displays using um, blue and green wavelengths, not UV. Um, seeing in UV is really, can be really useful for the fly. For example, here you're seeing um, bananas illuminated by UV and visible light. And UV is, is very helpful for detecting um, ripe or bruised fruit. So for instance, this isn't just true of bananas. For instance, in um, citrus growers use UV illumination to pick out bruised fruit. So I'm gonna tell you about a mechanism I've identified that helps them to see UV objects like fruit as they fly towards them. Um, okay, so not everybody listening is a vision scientist. So vision in flies, as in mammals, is split into on and off pathways. And in, the, in this image, when you look at the light edges, you see a vase. On the other hand, um, when you look at the light decrements analyzed by the off pathways, uh, when you look at them, then you see two faces in this image. Now, both of these views are carried by your brain. And the mechanism I'm gonna describe allows flies to process two views simultaneously that allow it to see the motion of UV objects, such as fruit, more clearly. Now you're used to thinking of on and off as a sort of complementary pair with um, on and off being opposites of each other. But we're gonna add wavelength, um, wavelength processing to one of those channels so that there are two monochromatic luminance channels with different wavelength sensitivity. And this is gonna have simple but counterintuitive consequences. Okay. So first, um, I built projectors to display UV and green patterns. So in this setup, uh, I tether a fly and, I'm, and, she's, and, and she's flying and I illuminate her with infrared light and I watch the shadows of her wing beats. And here she's turning left and I can see that because she's, she beats her right wing with a greater amplitude. So by tracking these wing movements, I can tell how she's reacting to the visual stimuli. So these, in this setup, the patterns are displayed uh, onto um, Teflon screens. And um, when you do that, the irradiance patterns are very different for UV and green. Um, the, the, the green is scattered much less than the UV. Um, I corrected for this using a luminance mask for the green channel so that the green irradiance was linearly proportional to the UV, okay? And as a result, in the experiments I show you, the green channel is gonna be held constant and the UV intensity is gonna vary between naught and 50. And if, you, if you're a color vision scientist looking at UV and green, if you use um, spatial projections of UV, I really recommend you check the spatial distribution of the radiances. Right, in a setup like this, um, flies really respond well to um, simple patterns that generate, um, so things like bars, stripes, and approaching objects, and these generate robust um, behaviors. 
So I systematically investigated what their responses were like in UV. And that led to the discoveries I'm telling you about today. So they weren't really something that I was looking for, but I was very happy to find them. And I'm going to show you the responses to some of the most revealing patterns, so on and off edges and approaching disks. OK. So um, when I show her a green moving off edge, she's, oops, sorry. Uh, she's going to turn left. And when I show her a UV edge moving right, she turns right. Now, I keep the green intensity constant and vary the UV intensity. And when I do that, I can find the UV intensity um, so that um, the left and right turns balance and she flies straight ahead. So when the UV intensity is dark, she turns with the green. And when the UV is bright, she turns with the UV. And at an intensity of about nine, the two balance, and that's the isoluminance point for off motion. Okay. Now we can repeat this for on motion. When the, again, when the green edge moves right, she turns right. And when the UV edge moves left, she turns left. And I can vary the U intensity so that the green and UV balance and she flies straight. Now the UV intensity needed to balance green for on motion is about half, is, um, is half that of what's needed to balance off motion. And this means that in this setup, on motion processing is twice as sensitive to UV as off motion. Right, so that's, that's a big difference. Right. And this asymmetry, it was very surprising. We didn't expect it. And this asymmetry, we realized later, is the basis for the fly's ability to see the movement of UV objects like food. And I'm gonna walk you through understanding that. So, uh, when a UV object here, a, a disc, gets bigger, we predict that when the when it's bright, it will, it will be brighter than the green and it'll generate on motion. And when it's dark, it'll be darker than the background and also generate off motion. Sorry. Yeah. Um, at middle intensities, it will both be bright enough to generate on motion, but also to generate off motion. Yeah. So, now let's think about what happens when we just invert the color pattern. So we've got exactly the same intensities of UV and green, but just the patterns are inverted. And now we've got uh, a green disc expanding out of a UV background. When the UV is bright, the green objects will seem dark and it'll look like it'll be dark enough to generate off motion. And when the UV background is dark, the green objects will look bright and generate on motion. But now, at the middle intensities, the green disk just won't be visible. Um, even though the two patterns have the same um, color, you know, um, the, the, the same chromatic contrast and the same luminance contrast. Okay, so to, to back up, you know, um, this intuition, um, I'm going to show you uh, responses to looming disks. So, when when when, I when the looming UV disk is dark, first of all, she begins to turn towards it, and then as it just fully expands for a collision, she turns away. And when the um, when the UV disk is bright, she robustly turns away from it. And at all the intensities in between, she's responding to the UV disk. Um, so in order to quantify that, I'm taking the response in the time period around one second, which is when the, is the full expansion, and plotting that here. And for, when we invert the color patterns, so we've got green disks against UV background, 
when the UV is dark, it's a on, uh, it's generating on motion and there's a small response. And when the UV is bright, there's a small response again. But at the in-between values, there's just very little response at all. So this is a very striking effect. And um, it replicates across strength, uh, across different control strains, setups, and whether the, um, the flies are male or female. For example, um, um, we tested the difference in UV sensitivity for on and off motion in different Drosophila species. So um, in all the species we tested, uh, on motion was more sensitive to UV uh, than off motion. So all the on motion isoluminances are much lower than for off motion. Um, in this data, we were measuring um, all the flies for, for both conditions so that we could have pairwise comparisons. And because of that, it was limited to the range between nine and three. So that's why the data is limited got, um, between these two ranges. Okay. Um, so to understand what was going on at the cellular level, um, we first looked at the photoreceptors. So flies have, across their compound eyes, they have um, five classes, well, five spectral classes of photoreceptors. Um, under each eye facet, you either um, you, you get two flavors, either the pale or yellow omatidia. In both, you have the R1 to 6 uh, photoreceptors, which are um, the outer photoreceptors and sensitive to UV and green. And then the inner photoreceptors, the, R, um, the R7s, which sits on top of the R8s. And for both pale and yellow, um, R7s are sensitive to UV. And then the R rates are either sensitive to blue or to green. Um, okay. So um, using um, the, well, the first question I want to answer was whether it's on motion or off motion that's affected by UV. So to, to answer that question, we made no pain mutants. And so th these are mutants where the photoreceptors um, the photocascade is not functional, so the photoreceptors aren't working. And then we genetically, re um, we could rescue um, NORPE expression in, in the R1 to 6 photoreceptors. So here the luminance channel is for sure going to be working, um, but the, the inner photoreceptors that are mainly used for color vision um, are inactive. So by design, these are colorblind flies. They, they have to be colorblind because they've only got one wavelength sensitivity of the photoreceptors. Um, yeah, and then these and subsequent experiments, I just want to say thank you to Ed Rogers for making uh, many of the flies with reagents made by Heather. So um, in controls, uh, the on-motion responses are much more sensitive to UV than the off-motion responses. Um, but in the, the colorblind R1 to 6 rescue flies, the on-motion responses are the same um, eyes don't have a significantly different isoluminance as, as for off motion. So this, this means that UV is selectively augmenting on motion rather than suppressing off motion. So, so next we want to understand how UVs, um, which, which of the uh, you know, photoreceptors are enabling um, this difference. So just to make the plots a bit simpler, I'm going to plot the difference between the on and the off isoluminances. So here I'm just plotting the same data as in the, in the last slide. So here we've got the pairwise differences for, for on and off motion uh, plotted here for the controls. And then the, the pairwise differences that are nearly zero in, in the colorblind flies are, are plotted here. When we rescue R1 to 6 and one of the R7s, so either the pale or the yellow R7s. So these are the UV sensitive photoreceptors. We rescue some of this effect. Not all of it, but some of it. In contrast, when we rescue either the pale or yellow R8, we, we either don't rescue the effect or with a very small effect size. And across different combinations of rescue photoreceptors, when we rescue an, an R7 as well as R1 to 6, 
and we rescue the effect. Um, but if we just rescue combinations without an R7, so with the R8s, then we, then we don't really rescue the effect, except for, uh, for the yellow R8 where it's a small effect size. So overall, um, these data show that the, it's the R7s, which are sensitive to UV, that are providing the UV sensitivity of on motion in flies. Um, right. So what about the photoreceptor targets? So here I'm going to switch uh, slightly. So because we know quite a lot about the photoreceptor targets um, because um, of this really exciting project uh, that was the, the brainchild of uh, Matthias Vernitz in Berlin and, and Michael here in Geneva. Um, we, it was a really exciting project. It, I don't know, it's really opened up um, new avenues for looking at uh, circuitry of color and polarization vision in flies. Um, so we took the, um, um, the, the existing um, EM data uh, from our whole um, uh, uh, full adult fly brain, so the, the, the FAFB um, um, data. So this is a whole Drosophila fly brain that's published in cell from Davy Box Lab in the Seng et al. 2018 paper. And then we traced the, R the, the R7, some R7 and R8 photoreceptors um, in the central eye and along the dorsal rim. So along the, the dorsal rim of the eye, the photoreceptors are specialized for sensing polarization vision. And we wanted to compare the circuitry uh, between these two to see how they were specialized for polarization vision or color, or color vision. Um, so this was, a, this was a big team project and I was one of four people along with Emil Alyosha and Arthur who um, sort of led the analysis. Um, the traces were amazing. Um, so in the fly optic lobe, um, um, our, our one to six photoreceptors, so these are the, the photoreceptors really important for luminance, they terminate in the lamina. Whereas the R7 and R8 photoreceptors pass through the lamina without making any synapses and then terminate in the medulla. So the first thing we did is we took um, a class of cell, MI1 type of cell, and um, we reconstructed uh, the MI1s across this whole EM volume. And that way we could create the retinotopic organization uh, of, um, across the medulla. So this is obviously quite a lot of work and um, thanks, to, thanks to Arthur for this. Uh, he, he led a lot of that. Um, now, in the central eye, the R7 photoreceptors terminate in layer six and the R8 photoreceptors terminate in the third layer. But along the dorsal rim where they, which is important for polarization vision, they both terminate in layer six. So Emil and colleagues could work out which of the um, columns in the medulla were uh, from, corresponded to the dorsal rim. And then for the central eye columns, the pale and yellow, the individual genius of Alyosha Nern noticed that uh, the AME12 cells, so these are accessory medulla cells in, in really important for circadian entrainment. These cells selectively innovated pale um, um, columns. So this is shown, we're showing that here in, the, in this uh, double expression pattern where in magenta, you've got the AME cells. And then in all the ones where they're not present, we're staining uh, yellow, um, R8 cells. So you can see that they only innovate the, the pale columns. And this meant by reconstructing the ME12 cells, we could designate all the columns across the medulla uh, that were pale or yellow. Uh, so I, I, really, I really like this picture. It's like the best Easter egg. Now then, um, th so then we took, so now that we know which, this was a major advance because Previous to that, we, it was really difficult to know which were the pale and which were the yellow columns. You, you couldn't do it in, in tracing EM circuitry. 
So that now we could pick two pale and two yellow columns and then three DRA columns and reconstruct the, um, the targets of these cells. So th this is um, a long paper. It's a, it's, um, uh, a really good reference work. Um, I, th I think um, standout features of it is that the data is really high quality. So, so we traced 95% um, of the target cells. So that, that's really pretty much all of the, all of the synapses we could trace to, um, we could say what the postsynaptic partners were. And we also made loads of drive, um, we also made driver lines for many of the new cell types described. So not only can you read about the circuitry, but you also, um, there's uh, reagents to be able to um, investigate them. So, um, yeah, th this is a really exciting project and um, there's, there's an awful lot in it. And I'm just going to tell you about a very small number of results that relate to color processing and to this connection between color and motion vision that, that I'm talking to you about. Um, but, um, okay, so here we go. Here's a, here's a very small number of highlights. So um, the first thing is, um, Christopher Schneidman, uh, when he was in Dirk Ries' group, um, did some very important work showing that R7 and R8 photoreceptors inhibit each other, and that this is a really important part of opponent process, color opponent processing. So we found that many of the photoreceptors aren't in the brain region, but they're sort of between the brain regions. So, so these are the um, R8 um, synapses onto R7s, and particularly, the R7 to R8 synapses were missing in previous reconstructions. And, and here they are in, in, the, in the axonal projections between the lamina and the medulla. So previously there have been reconstructions of lamina and medulla, but uh, for some cell types, a lot of the synapses um, are present here in this um, axonal sort of projection between the two neuropils. And retrospectively, it might not be that it might not be surprising, but at the time we were very surprised. And for um, a number of cell types, particularly L3 and L1, so these are lamina, these are cells in the lamina, more than 50% of their inputs are in this, um, in, you know, um, in these axons. So they were totally missed you know, in, in previous um, attempts to try and track the circuitry. Um, so that's going to be very important for picking up the story of like how color can get into the motion pathway later. Um, and now, as well as the motion pathways, um, a lot of the um, cells receiving input from the R7 and R8 that are involved in color vision are passing through the lobula. And in the, in the lobula, the um, there are um, um, a number of cell types that um, respond to approaching objects. So um, um, the, there's every, so we think that the lobule is really important, not only for color processing, but also for object processing. And particularly in the kind of behaviors where I'm describing where flies are responding to an expanding object, it's many different, um, there's a number of different cells that you'd expect to be involved. Um, now, uh, similar work from Chihon Lee's lab in particular had shown that subtypes of TM5 neurons, so these are neurons that uh, go from the medulla through to the lobula, are selective for pale and yellow R7 and R8 inputs. So these are cells that um, could maintain the wavelength specificity of the individual R7s or, or R8s in pale and yellow columns. And he showed that these cells are collectively required to discriminate isoluminant green and blue patterns. So when flies are trained to dis discriminate between is isoluminant color patterns, um, between isoluminant colors, we needed to have these cells. So in our tracings, we could confirm that and sort of extend those, um, those findings. So for instance, the TM5A cells are selective. They just get inputs from the yellow R7s and not from any 
pale, no Arsenes aureus from in, in the pale columns. And the TM5B cells um, get pale Arsenes, but not yellow. And then also the TM5C neurons get yellow R8 inputs. And so in some sense, if this isn't your system, I can understand this being like an alphabet soup. But the point is that there are specific kinds of neurons that care about um, input, that get direct input from specific kinds of photoreceptors that have specific wavelength sensitivity. And so that, that information is being transmitted on into the brain towards cells that are important for seeing color objects. And, um, okay, so, um, and not only could we confirm this, but also we could show that there weren't many other cells. You know, we could say how many, the number of cells that actually get these inputs. Um, so, an, another highlight of the paper for me anyway, um, was uh, an entirely new pathway for information to get to the lobula, uh, well, newly discovered. Uh, so rather than traversing through the medulla, um, rather than just traveling through to the, um, to the lobula, uh, like the TM cells, the, these ML neurons just go round the side and they also make synapses in the central brain. Um, these cells are really interesting. And I'm here, I'm just geeking out. Um, but so here we've got like with light microscopy, we've got um, the population of neurons and individual um, individual cells. Beautiful images from Alyosha. And the, the population of cells divides into like a, a dorsal population and a ventral population. Um, so there's some level of retinotopy. Um, collectively, they cover the whole of, um, the, of the medulla. So they're covering the whole of retinotopic space. But one population is basically looking at the sky, and one population is looking at the ground. So this is an example of something where there might be quite specific color circuits um, going on, um, depending on whether you're looking at the sky or the ground. Um, but I'm speculating wildly. Um, okay, so I, I'd like to talk more about all that, but at some point, I'm, I'm gonna go back to, um, so the, um, the kinds of things that we could do with all this data is say, for instance, like here, this is a summary diagram from the paper where we could show all the cell types that care about the specific pale or yellow R7s or R8s. Um, and we can quantify that. So here the arrows, the, the thickness of the arrows is proportional to the number of synapses to cells um, that are selective for, for the individual photoreceptors. So he, the, here we can begin to put sort of quantify the extent to which color information is progressing um, from the photoreceptors out to different pathways. And we can do that for the, going back to the UV objects, we can do that for the R7s and the R8s. And this tells us that there's a small number, relatively small number of connections of, um, from R7 to cells that can then inform motion pathways. So the T4 and T5 cells are the on and off motion pathways that we know a lot about. But there's um, many more connections to neurons to the, uh, to the lobula and also to the central brain that may well be uh, are highly likely to be involved in, in seeing color objects. So I, I want you to, that's something that we could sort of quantify and know from, from this study. But I, I want you to keep in mind that th these cells exist, but I'm just gonna go, what I'm gonna tell you about today is just um, the role of R7 to these T4 and T5 inputs up here. Um, <clears throat> right. So when we silence T4 and T5 by expressing um, Kia, so an inward rectifying potassium channel, um, we abolish all the responses to our looming UV disks. So we know that we need to have the T4 and T5 cells. Um, but previous work by Krishna Malnitor when he was in um, Chihon Lee's lab, the, uh, and other people had shown that when you presented uh, gratings, like blue-green gratings, you could vary the colors so that 
uh, you could find a point where there was an isoluminance point, and then the motion responses, the optimotion responses, would disappear. So the, the strong expectation was that motion processing um, shouldn't have, should have an isoluminance point, and you should be able to null. And so for T4 and T5, which um, two cell types that <clears throat> really important for motion processing in flies, the strong expectation was that if you showed off motion, then you should get T5 responses. And if you showed on motion, so bright disks, you should get uh, T4 responses. But there should be some intensity in between where you shouldn't see re uh, responses in T4 or T5 cells. Um, so, um, so I, imaging from the, the, the T5 cells um, using our gecko, so we're imaging in red and showing UV and green stimuli that's uh, just the same as we do, very similar to what we use for the, the behavior experiments. You see that the T5 cells respond when the, when the discs are dark. Um, and then as you increase the brightness of the discs, then the, the um, responses um, are eliminated. And um, to quantify the responses, we're again taking the responses of the cells as the, so as the discs loom, that, that point where they're, they're fully expanding and you have the maximum response of the cells, that's what we're using to quantify the responses. So, um, when the discs are dark, T, you have T5 responds, and then the, the magnitude of the response decreases to the nice elements around about eight. When, when I image the T4 cells, they're active when the, when the discs are bright, and then as the discs are darker, the, um, the response disappears for illuminance around about, isoluminance around about five. So this means that when discs are dark, T5 responds. When discs are bright, T4 responds. And when they're in between, T4 and T5 are responding. So as for the behavior, there's no intensity of UV discs where you're not getting a response. Now this was really surprising um, and um, I didn't expect it. And the question immediately is, how is information getting from R7 to the T4 cells? So um, we, know quite a, we know a lot about um, the circuitry of T4 cells. Um, so, here um, I'm showing um, histograms of uh, the inputs uh, to T4. So these are medulla cell types. So roughly speaking, information comes in from the photoreceptors to the lamina and then to the medulla through to T4 and T5. Um, the, the medulla cell types are presynaptic to T4 or MI1, TM3, MI9, MI4. And these four cell types themselves are highly driven by um, the lamina cells. So L1 is particularly important for driving MI1 and TM3. But L5 is driving MI4 and L3, MI9. So this, this data is taken from the um, seven column medulla reconstructions from my Janelia colleagues. Um, so this is again, a little bit of an alphabet soup and we can make it simpler. Um, so here's a, a, a diagram sort of simplifying some of these connections that we can then like follow um, to, through some imaging experiments to see how T4 can gain its um, UV sensitivity. Um, so, um, <clears throat> um, I've included DM9 um, because from lovely work from Rudy Benyu's lab with Sarah Heath, uh, we know that DM9 is a, a cell that also helps, um, plays a significant role in color opponency in R7 and R8 and is very sensitive to UV. So this cell can be like a benchmark for sensitivity to UV in our data set. And I also just want to give a shout out for Trevor Wardill's work on this. So he did a beautiful paper in 2012 that showed that somehow R7 and R8 feed into the lamina circuitry. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, 
the yeah okay so imaging so imaging first of all i'm just going to show you so this is imaging the lamina cells so l1 is really important for generating on motion responses and l2 is really important for generating off motion responses and these two cells are highly interconnected in the lamina so you'd expect them to have very similar properties. It would be very difficult to explain if they were diff different. And they're both off sensitive. So they, they respond when the discs are dark and then the magnitude of their response decreases to a nice illuminance, which we can see here. So for L2, it's very similar to L1. So that, that's good news. And if we, um, these two isoluminances are, so the lie between the isolimitances for T4 and T5. Okay, so L1 drives, is important for driving activity in MI1 and TM3. And when we, when I image um, them, their isolimitances are also very similar to L1 and L2, as is L4 in the, in the off, which is important for driving cells in the off pathway. Now things get really interesting. So L5 is a prominent input to, um, um, to MI4 in particular. And both L5 and MI4 are much less sensitive to UV than L1, L2, and even T4, T5. So they're more sensitive to green, as is C3. Now, L3 drives input to MI9, and both these cells are, are much more sensitive to, to UV than T4. They're not as sensitive as DM9, our sort of UV sensitive reference cell, but they're more, sen they're, uh, more sensitive than um, these mid range lamina cells. So, um, this, overall, this was just sort of really not expected um, that there'd be this range of spectral sensitivity across such an early part of the optic lobes that are thought only to get input so directly from R1 to 6, and then um, with sort of minor inputs to the lamina cells in the, um, in the mandala from R7 and R8. Um, <clears throat> but um, it, the data indicates that the path from R7 to T4, the reason why T4 is uh, UV sensitive, is that UV information is, is, is getting there from MI9, from, ML, from L3, and presumably from R7. But it is quite complicated. So for instance, MI9 and MI4 very much are, are both inhibitory neurons that are very much coupled to each other. And so in part, um, some of their spectral properties are, are probably coming from mute, their mutual inhibition. Um, so I, it's not just as simple as just like a, a feed forward circuit of just one spectral channel. Um, okay, so, um, right. Right, so I've shown you data. Um, so I've shown you a sort of a circuit basis for how UV can augment motion vision in the T4 pathway. But um, it's important to remember that there are these uh, UV sensitive cells going through to the lobula and cells in the lobula also be contributing to the behavior. So one of the things I'm doing going forward is imaging the activity of these cells to see how they might contribute as well. Okay, finally, I'm gonna sort of pull back out from fly world and um, I'm just gonna return to the question of color, motion, and isoluminance. And I just want to walk you through how this mechanism could work for your visual system, um, sort of be it like another animal or just an artificial sort of machine vision system. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna walk through how color could increase uh, the motion signal uh, for, for this orange that, that, that we met at the beginning of the talk. So um, we're gonna do that. Um, we're gonna imagine moving towards, towards or away from the center of the orange 
So like motion along the on, along these um, uh, just uh, uh, in these directions. And um, how we actually calculate the motion or implement many aspects of the, of, of the model doesn't really matter because it's quite a simple mechanism at heart. Okay, but the way I've done it is that for every pixel on the image, so there's 170 hexagonal pixels on the image, I can calculate what the on signal would be, what the on contrast would be. So that for, for this little um, hexagonal pixel in the middle, I can look at the intensity in its neighbors. And if they're greater than in the intensity in these neighbors, then it would be on motion that you'd see when you moved in that direction. But if the intensity was less in, in these neighbors than here, then it would be off motion. And if flies are four cardinal directions, so we can do four cardinal directions, left up, right, and down. And we can, so as we, we can just simulate what the motion is that we experience as we either go towards this orange or away from it. And then we can plot what that motion signal, we can just take all those 170 um, motion signals and, and plot them. And if you calculate the on motion using the luminance channel, so here I'm just adding up the red, green, and blue in, in, in the photo. It doesn't really matter what the function, you know, what it is, as long as it's just uh, a luminance channel. If you, if you calculate the on and the off motion using the same luminance channel, then you're gonna get very similar uh, motion estimates whether you're going towards or away from the orange. But now, sorry, if you calculate the on motion using red, so to go back to the example, if I calculate the red intensity for, for these pixels, and if it's greater than the red intensity here, then I've got an on motion signal going this way. We do this across the whole image. Um, if you calculate the on motion, with, so it's sensitive to red, and if you calculate the off motion for blue, then when you go towards the orange, you're gonna get a greater motion signal. And that's, I think that's pretty obvious. It's not, it's not that complicated. Something with red in it is getting bigger and the background with blue in it is getting smaller. And conversely, when you go away from the object, you're gonna have a lower uh, motion signal. And I think, again, that's pretty intuitive. The, as you go away from the object, the amount of on red that you've got is gonna get less and the amount of blue off you get is also gonna be less. So what you're doing is setting up the mechanism to favor the detection of something that's a very common feature of the scene um, through your behavior. Right? So by moving towards it in a certain way, you're just gonna see something that's just there and you're not gonna see it in other situations, but I think not seeing an object as you fly away from it is probably perfectly acceptable for many, um, many animals. And you can, you can flip it around. You can either, if you set, for instance, the <clears throat> the on motion as being sensitive to blue and the off motion to red, then you would then augment how you, the motion as you went away from the object, right? Um, and um, at, at the expense of not seeing it so well as you approached it. So whatever your animal, like sort of, as long as it's got on and off um, processing, um, you can choose how to add wavelength information to an on or an off channel um, to enhance seeing the motion of, of that color object. So if you wanna see red, if you're a moth and you wanna see red flowers or you're um, a zebrafish who wants to see a shadow against um, a UV background, you can just add an asymmetry to your, to your on and off channels to facilitate that happening. And you're not, you're not tuning, you're not creating a filter that's a match to, um, you're not matching a, a, a natural scene statistic. You're just um, adding a mechanism that allows your behavior to give you more in one situation and less in another. I hope that makes sense. Um, right. Um, so to sum up, I hope I've shown you evidence that the, in flies anyway, there are two luminance channels, one for off motion and then one for on motion that's supplemented with UV. And that in flies, this is set up to detect UV objects. But whatever your animal, so with mouse or zebrafish, or to be honest, it could be a collision avoidance system for a car, um, 
you can um, you can do this too, just to augment your motion detection as you as you fly towards the object. Um, okay. Um, that, I just want to thank an awful lot of people. I want to thank Michael for for being a um, yeah, just a very clever and lovely uh, PI, and Ed for making um, just a huge amount of flies and being a great colleague, and Heather for her reagents, and Alyosha for, for uh, making some wonderful driver lines um, and being a great collaborator, and Jerry for being very supportive. David Stern's lab um, gave me the uh, Drosophila species, other Drosophila species, that was wonderful, and Christian Branson's group were really helpful for discussing the machine vision algorithms. And then the Fly EM work just pulls in so many people, it's, it's hard to thank them all, but Greg Jeffries and Marta and FFB community and Flywire and at Janelia, um, and, uh, and after Janelia, Davi was great, and cousin Ori Luishina and Ian. Um, Ruchi led the team of tracers, and uh, the guys in Berlin are awesome. It's really fun working with them. And um, it's a really great community to be in. I, there are lots of people, like, the discussions and stuff. I just want to thank them all. Okay, um, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kit. Uh, impressive amount and quality of uh, both work and presentation. Uh, as the audience is still trying to grasp fully what you presented, like for me at least, like some of these maps are quite complex to fully follow. Yeah. Uh, I have already posted the Zoom room link in the chat, and the first question will be from me. So I think I will start with a technical question. Uh, sure. At some point, you showed. Uh, some data for the L1 and L2 neurons. Yes, and yes. for the L1, if I remember yes. correctly, it zeroed and then it went up again, right? Yes, yes. So is this like, um, do you think it's meaningful or some peculiarity in the data? I, I think, um, I'm not sure. Um, the, yeah, um, some, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so some of it, some of this is, um, What's happening here is the off response. So the, the stimulus, there is, the stimulus is um, becoming um, brighter and then, um, and then we're resetting to a green screen. So what's happening here with the gray response is just the offset of the stimulus. So that's, that's, um, that's just a genuine off response. But there is a tiny little um, response that I think is genuine and um, I don't feel qualified to really um, say, but it means that, that there is a tiny little bump up here um, that, that, that feels like it's genuine. Um, but um, I, I don't recall from L1s often enough to, to have a good intuition. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So the first question appearing in the chat is from Anna Vlasic. Uh, really cool idea that the system would perhaps go against seeing stat statistics to highlight relevant materials in the environment. Are there other examples of this in the fly or even other organisms? Um, um, yeah, I mean, most of the ones that come to mind is when the, the I'm not sure, it's not going against the statistics. It's just um, as well. So there are many examples where you've got private communication channels that you can see and you can prioritize, um, but, um, yeah, I, what I was trying to emphasize here was that in addition to seeing things in the natural scenes, you can also just give yourself a neural mechanism that when you have the right behavior, then gives you an edge in certain situations. Um, and that's, you're not really, it's not really about the information being out there. It's about how you're set up to behave well. And would having more color axis um, either improve or refine this synergy of color and uh, motion vision? So, um, um, yeah, I don't know how specific, yes. So, so if you had like, I haven't thought it through properly in a trichromatic system, you know, um, sort of uh, how specific it would be. Um, what I do think is that, um, yeah, so I, I can't, I, I can't say, I imagine that it could be quite specific to a particular uh, band of, of wavelength. Um, but um, one thing you can do is you could set up parallel pathways so that 
that were the opposite of each other so that you you then complemented the situation and so that you you then could see say for instance you could always in my stimuli you could always see the green discs or the uv discs you, you would just you'd have two pathways to do that but you'd have to double up on all the neural hardware and whether the cost of doubling up outweighs the benefit i don't know so i think if you made it very specific what's amazing mind-blowing to me is that the whole of the t45 system might be geared up to sort of be biased in this way and um uh but if you if you had too many parallel systems you could be just quite wasteful with your resources so i um how that all plays out in, in practice i'm not quite sure mm -hmm. thank you very much there are a lot of people both greeting at the beginning of the talk and congratulating okay. you uh, at the end uh, as a reminder to the audience he I can't, doesn't I can't. have access to the messages right now, even okay. though they're on public display, because he's focusing on the talk and I'm focusing on moderating and doing the technical parts. Uh, I will be posting the link once again, as I will be uh, terminating uh, live uh, transmission, like live broadcasting any minute now. So if you would like to um, continue with us, uh, this or any other uh, informal discussion, make sure to follow that link. Um, and another question I have personally is like when you mentioned the uh, yellow and the blue columns, yes. and you saw like how they are distributed. Uh, do we expect any regional functional differences in their properties, or do we expect them to be uniform throughout? Yeah, so so they're 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 they're, pre, they're, they're stochastically determined during development, and so the, the the organization of them is 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 random and stochastic, and the um. Uh, there are other insects where you do see like a gradient of blue or UV receptors it's sort of dorsal ventrally. Um, but in, and there, the, there is like tiny, you know, distribution of, um, in, it's the, the, for, um, for some Drosophila species, but basically it's random. And so like one problem with, for instance, looking at like blue green stimuli is that only about a third of the, these omatidia um, are specialized to see blue. And so then if you wanted to have like an object detector, your spatial resolution is really quite poor because you're stochastically sampling, you know, um, so you'd, ha you'd have to view over quite a large area. Um, the, um, yeah, it's a favorite game is to think why it's a good advantage to have the stochastic arrangement. Yeah, maybe Simon wants to offer some insights. Uh, as people are already joining us, uh, I can uh, once again repeat that I'm officially waiving my moderator rights. So okay, by any means, if someone wants to ask a question, you can freely uh, unmute yourselves uh, and go ahead with it. Thank you, George. Thank you, Keith. Simon, I see you are unmuted. Uh, I'm unmuted, yes. I don't know. I'm out of control here. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think what, what really interested me about this was that it looks as if the rules for using colour to um, as a source of, or spectral sensitivity, different spectral sensitivities, as a source of signal yeah. in... Um, is really quite specific for the detection of relatively small objects, moving objects. The, I mean, the old idea was that, that um, an achromatic system is, is better because you don't get interference, contrast interference between color and motion. Yeah. And I think what this talk has highlighted is that that's true if you're integrating over large elementary motion over large fields. Yeah. But the minute you begin looking at local things, maybe yeah. there's some information there, some very useful signals that you can get from your other, from your spectral channels. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm still puzzled this, if this is all so useful, why doesn't the fly have a better complement of color, color channels, right? I mean, it's invested incredibly heavily in achromatic inputs yeah and it's it's bundled color and polarization into a very relatively small number of small photoreceptors yeah i the um i think the dynamics of it are really important and so i i think when the stimuli are new 
uh, then it like it's really useful. And then once the once they've been there for like a few seconds, and then I think the adaptation is kicking in, and it's you're you're back to a sort of um, uh, just a like um, a single luminance channel again. Um, I think it's hard to know how to wait, how to present it in the. Um, it's quite new, I think it is quite new and a different, like the, clearly the luminous channel we've done there. You, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, that is the way to present it, you're quite right, because it is new and it is a different way of, of thinking about the processing of inputs from in, in optic load. Um, and getting on to what Anna said, I think it would be very interesting to know more about these um, spectral signals in, in nature. Yeah. And I don't know that there's really been a lot done on the distribution of, of, of information in UV channels, period. Because, um, you know, you can't buy a camera that does it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, it's quite difficult. Um, yeah, it's difficult to measure them. I, you know, like, yeah. 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 You haven't made a camera that you can mount on the head of a fly yet so that you can just capture its natural world. Well, they did that. Did you see the beetle where they did that? Yeah, they, they, I think they, I did, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Beetles so are Rob, big, bigger, right? <laughs> Rob de Reuter did that. And he built a, and he had a fly mounted on his bicycle helmet, recording from H1 extracellularly. And he found that. It was too dangerous to cycle fast, fast enough to drive it. And that's why he did the fly on a stick experiment. So it's actually, it's very difficult for a human being to mimic a fly's natural movements. So I, you, you want to buy yourself a nice little drone. I really hate uh, interrupting you, Simon, uh, just for um, the sake of clarity and of closing the broadcast. Yeah. There was one last question from Claudio Alonso, uh, and I read it. Brief, naive question. Is UV isoluminance wired in the system or somehow learned via experience? Uh, mm -hmm. What happens if you grow flies in the dark? Thank you, Claudio. So um, I, don't, I don't know the... I don't know that. We haven't tried... Um, if they're growing in the dark, I don't know. But I do think that um, adaptation in the in the R sevens is playing a big role. So that the there's a temporal dynamics to to the effects, um, and then in that sense, it's not fixed. Um, uh, in that, it's affected by prolonged exposure to, to UV. Thank you very much, Kit. And with that, I terminate the broadcasting and we continue uh, here. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And of course, thanks, Kit, for uh, honoring us with your presence and your talk. Thank you. Thank you.